What's going on guys, Vulcan here, and today we're back in Torchlight 3 with some tips and tricks and some mistakes to avoid if you're a new player to the game. Now, a lot of this stuff are things that I had to go through and discover myself just through clicking around, exploring, and seeing what all the game had to offer. Most of these things the game doesn't tell you about. It's really up to you to either investigate and figure out what it is, or have a friend tell you or find it on a message board. So here I am telling you, these are some things you wanna do when you're first starting out in Torchlight 3. So we're gonna start off with the first thing you interact with, and that's gonna be your pet. Now your pet actually has pet skills. Now the game doesn't tell you this, but if you open up your skills and go all the way to the right, you're gonna have this paw print, and these are where your pet skills are going to live. Now when you first start, you're gonna have one skill slot, and this will be just a random skill depending on what your um, pet is. So for instance, it could be Defender Aura or Battle Cry, typically between those two, depending on what rarity it is. I think my little sprite here started with Defender. Anyway, as you level up, you're going to unlock three additional slots. Now, unlocking these skills is as easy as finding pets. You find a pet that has a new skill, you unlock that, that skill. So here you can see I don't have Necro Pupper because I haven't tamed a pet with that skill to unlock it. And as you level up, like I said, you gain these additional three skill slots. So make sure to go through and slot in skills that are going to work for your build. Right now, I have increased damage, stuns, and immobilize. Obviously, it's a cyclone build, so I want them to stay put as long as they possibly can. So pet skills are important. Make sure to go out here and set those. Now, the next thing are contracts. The game will start you off on the adventurer's contract by default. And as you go through the game, you complete quests, you kill enemies, basically you just play. You're going to build up something called fame. As you build up fame, you're going to unlock different ranks. And this works just like any other battle pass. It actually will reset. You can see I have one reset here where you get to the top rank and it just rolls back over to one and starts giving you all the rewards over again. And this is great. The adventurer pack has a lot of random stuff in here. You have essence bundles, you have fort decorations, you have gear bundles, you have gold. So there's quite a few different things to kind of help you out. But there's also a switch contract button and clicking this will give you access to craftsman's contract and homesteader's contract. So if you're somebody who really likes crafting, you can make this active and it'll flip back over to this one and you'll get access to more essence bundles, more crafting oriented things. And if you switch again, we can go over to the Homesteaders contract. This is gonna give you more things for your fort. You're still gonna get gold, you're still gonna get some resources bundles, but a lot of things are going to be fort oriented. So pick which one works best for you and what you are most interested in. So the next thing I wanna talk about is in your inventory under the consumables tab, this potions icon. And in here, you're gonna see your potions at the very top. Now, when you first start the game, you're just gonna have the good old regular health potion, you know, tried and true, gets the job done, recover 60% of your max health and knock back enemies. But as you move into new frontiers, you're gonna start getting new potions. Now, the problem here is when you acquire a new potion, it doesn't automatically equip that new potion. It just places it at the bottom of the list. So as you're playing through the game, you're most likely going to have a lot of regular health potions to chew through first before you get to the new potions. So here you can see our antidote potion. This is one you get for the Hyvid Frontier. It clears poison status effect. It recovers 25% of your max health initially, and then an additional 10% per second for five seconds. So that's gonna be a grand total of 75% of your health, which is more than your regular health potion. And then you can see on the left-hand side, we have our polarized potion, which clears the shocked status effect. This one comes into play in Econoc. This clears our shock status effect, recovers 25% of your max health and an additional 7% per second, and also grants shock immunity for five seconds. So these potions are gonna help with the frontiers you get them from. Obviously you wanna use polarized potions for the Econoc frontier, and you wanna use antidote for the Hyvid frontier. That's gonna help with the status effects that you get from both of those. So be sure to come in here and slot these out to make sure you're using the correct ones. So the last thing I wanna talk about are fort items. Now, whether you're a housing person or not, there's some pretty cool items in here that are gonna help you with your gameplay experience. Me, I'm not a big housing guy. I'm not a big fort guy. Um, that's My wife loves to do that type of stuff, not me. So I just kind of throw everything into a circle here so I know where it is and I can just go click on it and get the hell out of my fort. Okay, so three things, a few things actually, that new players might not know about when you first start. First things, we're gonna talk about these three items right here the Functional Fortunato, the Hyvid's Bane Growth, and the Peking World Nasher. 
So as you go through the frontiers and you kill enemies, they're going to drop a currency. It's not going to pop up and tell you. It's not going to give you any sort of indication that you got a new currency. It's just going to say it'll be a little drop on the ground and then it'll float towards you and that's about it. You can see how many you have by clicking on all of these. So let's click on the Peking World Nasher. This is a good example. So in here we have plus two fire defense. You can see I have two of my little stones lit up here. I got three left, which leads me to believe we have plus 5% fire defense we're gonna be able to accrue over time. Now the way this works is you build up Goblin Fury. You do this by killing goblins, offer 10 at a time, and it'll allow you to extend this bar. Now if we go over to our Hivet's Bane growth, I have some here, you can see you just click and it'll grant you some progress. This gives poison defense, same thing. Then the odd thing here is we have the functional Fortunato, which you would figure would give shock defense because it is a shock focused zone, Econoc Mountains, but apparently it gives gold luck. So there's no built in shock as far as I can see, which is kind of strange. Anyway, those are three things that you can place by pressing F while you're in your fort, going over to functional and clicking on this little like ops, like a little obelisk type deal. And you get these right out of the gate. So you can go through and drop these the second you get access to your fort, which I would highly recommend. That way you can start building these up over time. The next thing I wanna talk about is your luck tree. So you'll get your luck tree through a quest. You don't get it right out of the gate, but this is something that is very important as you're going through leveling because you don't wanna really kind of waste anything. So as you're leveling, you're gonna get enough gold through your quest, through killing enemies, through killing elites. I mean, just naturally gold will accrue over time. Plus there's a 20,000 gold cap. So you don't really wanna hit that cap super quick. Then you're leaving gold behind on the ground. What I did through my entire leveling experience, my entire leveling experience was come to my luck tree and drop everything I could. Anything that was green or above, you can sacrifice this luck tree and it builds up your gear luck. So if I sacrifice this Draconis Staff, you can see it progresses it by like a millimeter, but over time, this will grow and get you to 5% gear luck. Now, I know what you're thinking. Vulcan, why don't I just sell this for gold and then gamble at the gambler so I can get legendary stuff and get this and that. That's great. But the problem is when you're leveling and you're going through and you're gambling things and trying to fill out your slots, that isn't going to be sustainable. You're going to replace the pieces of gear very quickly. And there's really no point. It's wasted gold at that point. When you donate to your luck tree, that's gonna be something that's with you forever. So you might as well just go out here and donate to this. Now, I do wanna talk about an additional thing with the luck tree. And this is another thing that some people might not know. All of these different kind of like crossroads will take you different people's forts. So let's go to the overgrown trek. All right, so we're here in the overgrown trek. Now, this is somebody else's fort. Um, this is apparently a rum runner's fort, and he has a little luck tree planted here. If you go to someone else's luck tree, you'll actually have plus 12% gear luck, plus 10%, and really kind of depending on the rarity, you'll get different amounts of gear luck. So if I sacrifice this jagged blade, I have a 300 second plus 10 gear luck buff that then I can go quest, I can turn things in, I can go you know, play the game basically and have better chances at finding legendaries and things like that. So it's always important to drop that uh, piece of gear on somebody's fort whenever you hit one of these little crossroad deals. So every time I hit one, I go in, I'll sacrifice a piece of gear. That way I can kind of try to have that buff up as long as I possibly can to benefit greatly from it. So those are some things that people often overlook. I know I did, and really a lot of these were discovered by just me clicking around, wondering, hey, what happens if I donate to somebody else's luck tree? What happens if I you know, enchant my piece of gear at somebody else's enchanting altar? Nothing happens. But a lot of these things were just self-discovery. The game doesn't really do a great job of telling you about these things. I think that's probably on purpose. But either way, I hope these tips were helpful for you guys. If you guys want to see any other tips and tricks, please let me know. Also, what are some things that you guys discovered about the game that you might want to share with other people? Drop them in the comment section below. But as always, this has been Vulcan, and I'll talk to you guys next time. One.